I'm Rick McGuire, we're here at ASCO, and we're looking for a better approach. Investigators evaluated Rentuximab plus ADD for non-bulky limited stage Hodgkin lymphoma, and I am with Dr. Jeremy Abramson, MD, Clinical Director of the Center for Lymphoma, Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center in Boston. Now, you're trying to avoid bleomycin, isn't that the, the whole point here? That's exactly right. There are really two points. You know, we cure the majority of patients with limited stage Hodgkin lymphoma. The most common way we do that is ABVD followed by radiation therapy, and that results in a cure rate of close to 90% for patients with their initial treatment. Right. But that but includes the late effects of radiation therapy, including secondary cancers, heart disease, and lung disease, which is a big deal for, for disease that primarily affects young people, and the effects of bleomycin which though it does contribute some in efficacy, there are deaths every year from bleomycin lung toxicity. And so our question was, given that the field is evolving, given that fact that we now have some targeted therapies that work at biologically in Hodgkin lymphoma, can we remove the bleomycin, can we remove the radiation, and substitute in one of those targeted therapies, optimize the cure rate, minimize long-term toxicity. And in this case, brentuximab. And so here we've decided to use brentuximab vidotin, the anti-CD30 monoclonal antibody conjugated to monomethyl orostatin E. Now what did you find? Well, what we found was very exciting efficacy. The way we started our phase two study is actually everybody received a single cycle of brentuximab monotherapy alone. The idea was we really don't know how well brentuximab works as a single agent, and this would be a lead-in opportunity to just get a sense of that as an, investiga an investigational tool. Right. And so we gave everybody just two doses of brentuximab vidotin on day one and day 15 of the initial lead-in cycle at a dose of 1.2 milligrams per kilogram. And what we found remarkably was just over half of patients were in a complete remission even before starting chemotherapy. Wow. So already we saw that this drug was looking highly active. The remaining of the patients, which was about 47%, had achieved a partial remission at that point, and nobody had progressive disease before starting chemotherapy. We then decided to combine brentuximab with AVD chemotherapy, adriamycin, vinblastine, and decarbazine, without, of course, bleomycin. Patients received this regimen on traditional day one and day 15 of a 28-day cycle, and we gave two cycles of brentuximab AVD, followed by an interim PET-CT scan. What we found in that point is among 34 patients who we accrued, 33 were evaluable at that time point. One patient was considered non-evaluable at that point because unfortunately one patient, an elderly patient, a 71-year-old patient uh, with Hodgkin lymphoma actually died of neutropenic sepsis during combination chemotherapy, reminding us that the treatment of elderly patients with Hodgkin lymphoma is prone to high risks of treatment-related toxicity. However, that patient had achieved a complete remission after the brentuximab monotherapy cycle. If you then look at the 33 patients who reached their interim PET-CT scan after cycle two, 100% of them were in a complete remission after two cycles of treatment. Wow. Now that interim PET-CT scan has become a very important biomarker in Hodgkin lymphoma. Early achievement of a complete remission translates very nicely into overall cure rate. And in fact, if you look at ABVD results across numerous clinical trials, ABVD alone produces an interim complete remission rate consistently of about 80%. So our 100% rate of complete response was certainly cause for excitement. The way we designed our clinical trial was that for those patients who achieve a complete remission after two cycles of brituximab AVD, they would receive only two additional cycles of chemotherapy to complete four cycles total. Those patients without a complete response but without progressive disease could receive four additional cycles and complete six cycles total. The fact that all patients achieved an interim complete response on their initial PET-CT scan meant that no patients in our study would receive six total cycles. Patients received a maximum of four cycles of chemotherapy. At the conclusion of that uh, endpoint, we had uh, 32 evaluable patients, and at that endpoint, a single patient had progressive disease and was taken off clinical trial at the end of treatment and given salvage chemotherapy and is now in remission after high-dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplant. 31, however, of those patients achieved a complete remission and are in ongoing remission at this time. There were two unevaluable patients at the end of treatment time point. One was the, was the patient who died of treatment-related sepsis, a 71-year-old patient who died during combination chemotherapy, regrettably, and an additional patient was removed from clinical trial before the end of treatment because of hypersensitivity reactions to brentuximab. Both of those subjects had achieved a complete remission on their prior interim restaging. 
The result is, is that our progression tree survival at a median of 14 months is now um, 94%, and the, and the overall survival at 14 months is 97%. So what have you learned? Well, I think we've learned a few things. One thing that we learned is that defining complete response at the end of treatment proved a little tricky. And the reason for that is we saw a significant number of what our investigators felt were false positive PET scans at the end of treatment. Now, PET scans were interpreted centrally uh, based on a central radiologist who is not aware of the clinical scenario. And they assigned PET positivity by a Deauville score of one through five. In our clinical trial, Deauville one through three was considered PET negative. Deauville four through five was considered PET positive. At the end of treatment restaging, eight patients had PET scans interpreted as positive based on Deauville scores of four to five. However, according to the investigators, only one of those subjects were believed to truly have progressive disease, while seven were believed to have false positive PET scans. And in fact, there's a Deauville score for that called Deauville X, which is where if you believe that new PET avidity is seen unrelated to Hodgkin lymphoma, you label that as Deauville X, meaning likely unrelated. So according to investigators, seven of eight positive PET scans at the end of treatment were actually Deauville X. And among those subjects, six of them were simply observed for two months, had a repeat scan, all of whom were then in a confirmed complete remission, one of whom, at the discretion of the treating investigator, received two additional cycles of AVD, the same treatment they'd previously received, were also in an ongoing complete remission without any intensified therapy. It makes us think that perhaps restaging at the three to four week time point after the final treatment might be too soon, and that if we restage later, we might see fewer of these inflammatory changes. Presuming we're correctly identifying the responders, we learned that this regimen was highly active. We learned that if you look early on, we're seeing dramatic early benefit from the monotherapy as well as with combination therapy, and seeing a very early biomarker of success based on a 100% complete response rate on an early interim PET CT scan, boding well for ongoing remissions. Now we do only have 14 months of interval follow-up, and so we need at least two years of follow-up to really assess whether these remissions are gonna be sustained and whether it's gonna be sufficiently appealing to replace both bleomycin and radiation, but we're certainly very encouraged. So this was a phase two study? It is. So what's next? Well, what's next indeed? So this was a phase two study in limited stage non-bulky Hodgkin lymphoma. In advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma, a higher risk population, a randomized clinical trial is ongoing. And that trial is comparing the very regimen we use, Brentuximab plus AVD, with traditional ABVD in a phase three multicenter international trial. And what this trial is designed to show is in fact that we can achieve a higher cure rate with brentuximab AVD compared to ABVD and allowing us to remove bleomycin and decrease the late effects of bleomycin. That should help address that question in advanced stage disease. It won't directly affect limited stage disease where we still consider combined modality therapy as a treatment option. I do think if superlative activity is seen in the advanced stage study, our clinical trial would support ongoing investigation of brentuximab AVD also in limited stage disease. However, one also has to think about toxicity. And after all, we designed this trial to eliminate toxicity related to radiation and to bleomycin. And we think we've preserved efficacy in doing that, but need longer term follow up. However, there are naturally going to be toxicities from the novel agent that you introduced. True. And sure enough, we do think that we accentuated certain toxicities. So for example, among the first nine patients that we treated with brentuximab plus AVD, the majority developed neutropenic fever and required admission to the hospital. Now, despite neutropenia being extremely common with ABVD, admission for neutropenic fever is quite uncommon. And so it appeared to us that we were accentuating the neutropenic fever risk. What we did as a result at that point is amended the trial and said we have a treatment for neutropenia and, and required investigators to then use growth factor support with, with GCSF to ameliorate that as primary prophylaxis. And what we found is the rate of neutropenic fever dropped dramatically. At the end of study, the rate was close to 30%, but much of that is driven by the first um, uh, several patients before we amended the protocol. So in our opinion, it does appear that you increase neutropenic fever. However, that is an ameliorable toxicity. 
One additional toxicity that in our mind appeared increased was peripheral sensory neuropathy. Now, peripheral neuropathy is in fact the primary toxicity of brinduximab vidotin monotherapy, as seen in the registration trial. We rarely see peripheral neuropathy of any significant degree with vinblastine, though that is a risk of any vinca alkaloid. We found in our study that approximately 75% of subjects did develop some grade of peripheral sensory neuropathy. The maximal grade was one to two in the majority of patients. However, eight patients, which is close to 25%, did develop grade three peripheral sensory neuropathy, which means very limiting peripheral sensory neuropathy. So that was a bit alarming to us. Now that said, with ongoing follow-up, we found uh, that the majority of patients have had that, that peripheral neuropathy resolve. The median time to resolution is seven months after completing therapy. However, close to 30% of subjects still had some ongoing neuropathy at time of last follow-up. Most of that is grade one, meaning nuisance peripheral neuropathy, uh, and time is short, and we expect ongoing resolution, hopefully over time, though two subjects did have grade three peripheral neuropathy persisting at last follow-up, suggesting that some patients might be hypersensitive to this approach. Based on this, and given the high curability of non-bulky limited stage disease, we're actually be doing another clinical trial where we further reduce the chemotherapy backbone and eliminate the vinblastine. Oh, wow. These are, after all, highly curable patients. Um, we appear to have a very high cure rate with brintuximab AVD, but have overlapping toxicities between the vinca alkaloid uh, and brintuximab vidotin, and that's because they have overlapping mechanisms of action attacking the microtubule apparatus. So we think hopefully by eliminating the vinblastine will further reduce the toxicity profile and maintain efficacy. That study uh, will hopefully be reporting in a future interview. Well, that's really exciting. I mean, I think it's, it's a very optimistic story that you have to tell. I think so. And incorporating brentuximab vidotin in upfront treatment, both in limited stage and advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma, will hopefully continue to move the bar forward for our patients. We're also very excited to have had recent data presented at the American Society of Hematology looking at the immune checkpoint inhibitors, which are showing very exciting data in the relapse setting, and perhaps someday even moving forward up front. This is a time of great optimism for patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. You will read and see more about some of these trials here at Ash Clinical News, so please look around for the videos or read Ash Clinical News, where I am Rick McGuire and we are in Chicago. <laughs>